intent of the sponsors of the competition, but were there any ideas that came out of this that would in some way address those social and economic issues that you mentioned? Uh, I will, no, I will show some projects in which we, we did uh, address those issues, but uh, in this project, we yeah, it, it's, it stopped in a conceptual phase. Uh, but that's actually something that we encourage or we, we, we encourage our clients uh, to, especially when we start talking about how we're going to realize a project, to, to see if it's possible to introduce a social component into, the, the, into that realization tra trajectory. So I will show a couple of projects uh, further on in which we did manage to do that. Yeah. So um, in the U.S. now, um, certainly among the building conservation movement, there is a saying now that the greenest building is the one that's already been built. But it doesn't seem like that's the perspective in the Netherlands. No, it is. It is. This is an example of a new building, because we do also build new buildings. Um, but the majority is the existing stock. So uh, retrofitting, uh, which is something I'll touch on in a moment, is the biggest issue at the moment. How to, how to upgrade, how to get our existing stock uh, comfortable and healthy and energy neutral. That's a little bit of, it really upsets me uh, in the Netherlands. Energy has got so much focus. CO, CO2 reduction is the primary focus. And I'm trying to shift the discussion away from energy and CO2 to <coughs> health and comfort. Um, it should be about creating healthy environments. And great if it's energy efficient, but it would be really nice if the discussion would shift. And um, slowly we're starting to, uh, well, to shift the discussion a little bit, but it's, a, it's a still a very much a technical uh, approach at the moment in terms of uh, sus sustainability an eco-technical approach instead of a social, ecological approach. And that's really what I'm advocating. Um, now yeah, to move on to a project which is also a new project, uh, but in a different context. So that's just a little bit to show the, 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 the relationship <laughs> of climate and culture. This is a project in Mexico, um, which Ron has seen a couple of times. So bear with me, Ron. But what's interesting about this project, it's a, it's a tequila factory. And what we, we did was, it's a new project, but we could conceive the whole production process as well. It's not just about the building, it's a zero waste production process. Um, and what we tried to do is, um, we tried to come up with a production process and a building which is more than a, a, a factory. So uh, we've got, of course, a factory which is based on the Hacienda typology, which is the vernacular. And we've got a, a whole social wing which will house nine nuns. There will be a chapel, there will be a school, children from the factory will be educated. Uh, it will have a community center. Uh, it will have a museum, uh, an artist in residence, and uh, an office uh, function. And basically the zero waste concept is about um, closing production cycles to create as many byproducts as possible. So it's really about creating as much local economy as possible. In this case, <coughs> We very simply took the, the Hacienda typology, we analyzed the daylight that would be necessary. This is all, these are all daylight openings, the minimum amount of daylight. And then looking parametrically at the specific functions of the distillation process and the different ancillary functions, we morphed the, the openings to allow more daylight or more views or access, etc. So it's, a, it's again a parametric relationship between comfort and climate and use. And obviously, uh, it's about uh, local uh, traditions. So we uh, we build it with local building materials, but we also use the local building tradition. Uh, they're really you, you wouldn't say it if you see it. It looks kind of spacey and high tech, but it's based on the hacienda building me method, which is uh, something they're really good at. Is making arches with stone walls. Mm -hmm. So we just kind of gave it a walk. And actually, it's a little bit poetic, and normally I don't tell it, but. This pattern is, if you cut the agave, which is the plant, the cactus that you make uh, uh, tequila from, this is the pattern of the leaves. Something, a small detail that normally uh, I wouldn't share. Um, but as architects, we're also involved in the production process. So we're also the architects of the process. Um, and what you see here is the tequila production process in all its steps. And these are all the waste products. And what we do is we uh, utilize all the waste products. So we're going to create perfume uh, from tequila. We're going to create uh, biogas. We're going to create 
fertilizer, <coughs> fodder, textiles for clothing and furniture, um, inulin, which is a, a power snack. These are all secondary processes, um, and each secondary process represents a social economic uh, empowerment because we, we are linking it to the local community. So we're generating a, a whole array of jobs and this building will be expanded with ancillary buildings around it, so it will become a whole complex. And the idea is that there's 80% um, of the agave plant in Mexico is not being used. 20% is being used uh, for production and by introducing these seven other tequila products or waste products, we can expand the market. So to give an example, you could make uh, furniture uh, which would be then uh, used in, 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 in the chapel, that's one example, but also textiles. And this is a project that we're hoping to realize, but it's a very difficult project uh, to get the financing uh, for. Because it's, again, as an architect, we were approached by a client. Um, the client doesn't have money, <laughs> but he has a great idea. So we um, uh, participate as uh, we haven't received uh, money for doing this work. Basically, we are shareholders. So we are 1% one one shareholder in the whole project. Mm -hmm. And if it works out, we will make a lot of money. And if it doesn't work out, we will have nothing. But without us stepping in as shareholders, the project won't be, wouldn't be possible. Yes. I, I know this is sort of a side thing, but I have to know, why nuns? Why nuns? <laughs> what is going on with that? <laughs> uh, that's a really nice question, actually. <laughs> the, um, well, first of all, if you, if you saw our client, Victor, he's a little Mexican guy about this big, very enthusiastic. Um, he, he is uh, a little bit of uh, an anarchist and he's been uh, bumping heads with uh, the tequila cartel. Uh, in, the, in the 70s, uh, the, the cartels took over the tequila pr production, became industrialized. And he took, spent seven years um, uh, researching tequila and came up with this organic tequila mm -hmm. recipe. And his idea about the nuns is that, of course, tequila used to be for the people. But the industrialization of the process, uh, actually, yeah, the cartels make huge money, but the people are exploited. The people doing the work are exploited. And his idea is to turn this pyramid on its head. He wants to create a production process which is organic, and he wants to ensure that the local population receives as much of the money and the, the outcomes as possible. So his idea to marry the church and tequila uh, is, is symbolic. But it also makes sense in terms of, uh, in terms of um, the, the social aspect that we're trying to link to this project. Um, so we really think it's, uh, it's, it's in a way an absurd, an absurd connection. But on, the other, on the other hand, if you're trying to do more than just make a factory and give it a community function, then wow, the nuns are, are great kind of uh, mamas to, uh, to look after and the... the the nuns, yeah, he's spoken to nuns. There, he has nine nine nuns. Who, uh, <laughs> I love this. Uh, in the project. Yeah. Yeah. I totally yeah. love this. <laughs> but I think it's also it's also it's, maybe it's also symbolic. He really wants to yeah. put a project down which changes. It's built on traditions, but it brings state of the art technology and it's it's bringing tequila to the next level. It's a, a kind of. This pro project, the, the product we're launching, it's, uh, it's not for local consumption, it's for London, New York, no. and Tokyo. So it's, it's, uh, it's something that's been launched in London. So it's, it's, it's got a kind of international allure as well. Coming back to, to home and uh, an existing building, uh, this is a project in Rotterdam that we uh, realized. The others are all so just conceptual, but this is a project we realized in a fantastic old um, Silo building, um, basically the, the grain silos up in this building and what used to happen was the, the water was just behind the building, boats would come in with grains and all sorts and they would go up into the silos and they would be packaged in the, in the factory and then the train would stop here. So the whole building is dimensioned on the size of a train and those products would go into the city. This building <coughs> has, has been vacant for about 30 years. And uh, in 2010 or 11, we were asked to come up with a concept for it, uh, for, for reactivating the building. But actually reactivating the building as part of uh, reactivating an urban um, rejuvenation in the Merve Fee Havens. I'm not sure if you've been to the Merve Fee Havens area. 
It's one of the city harbor areas, actually on the other side of the water. Those three towers that you see there, actually designed by SOM from New York. Um, that's the Merv Fee Haven. So in, 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 in Rotterdam, we have a number of inner city harbor areas which are all being rejuvenated. And this is one of them. And what we did here was <coughs> we looked just at uh, primarily at one flow, and that's the material cycle. And uh, we said, well, if we consider our, the city as a material bank, based on the idea that materials, uh, resources are becoming scarcer, that we have to stop being more aware of the way in which we use materials, which kind of um, products are coming out of the city from production processes, but also from demolition processes, and which ones can we reuse uh, to create a new, uh, a new interior. And um, there's a local architectural firm called 2012. They changed their name in 2012. <laughs> they were called 2012 until 2012. <laughs> and then something happened, uh, had to happen, so they became super use. But they, um, they only work in this way, and they always have these harvesting maps. So this, uh, we just stole their idea, but I, I also just tell them that I stole their idea. Um, this is the Haka building, and basically what we did is we made a harvesting map. We uh, looked at which, per, which materials are coming out of production processes or uh, demolition processes in the near vicinity, because you want to keep materials uh, as close to the building as possible, and which can we use to uh, rejuvenate the, the interior. And what was interesting about this project was that we realized this project with unskilled labor. So we worked with um, uh, returning citizens, ex-convicts, ex a team of ex-convicts, I think we had eight to ten ex-convicts um, who had no skills. Uh, and we knew this from before. So we were using second-hand waste materials and we were using an unskilled team to realize it. And that's really interesting because that means that you have design criteria. Uh, you have to design using the intrinsic values of the materials, design for maximum uh, efficiency, uh, minimum waste, but you also have to design for a, a, a team who is not used to building. And that led to uh, very simple details, lots of repetition, and this actually gives a value to the project. It's an aesthetic uh, value to the project that we actually wouldn't normally be able to afford, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, some views of, uh, of the interior. Um, here, here you see an auditorium with, I think, 3,040 3, repetitive elements which make the benches. Uh, so someone was really, <laughs> really doing, doing 3,040 3, of the same uh, elements, uh, podiums. Uh, meeting rooms using second-hand uh, doors, pantries using a greenhouse and uh, roof slats and a, a huge acoustic wall. Um, and this project is, um, in a way, uh, it was an experiment, uh, but in, in a way it's also uh, become quite an iconic project in Rotterdam. Um, the Clean Tech Delta, which you may or may not have heard of, uh, the Cleantech Delta is a group of 40 companies who are in the Stadshavens, in the city harbour area. Um, they've, uh, they have a coalition and the, the ambition of the Cleantech Delta is to make the transition from um, a fossil harbour to a Cleantech harbour, a uh, Delta city. Uh, so the, the notions of resilience and ad adaptation, uh, maritime technology and Delta technology are all key notions but also connecting to um, uh, mitigation, smart grids, these kind of concepts. Uh, and the Cleantech Delta uh, was housed here. This was a, a headquarter building and, a, and, a, and a, an iconic uh, building for them. And what we did was we um, analyzed the impact. So basically this square represents the footprint of um, a normal interior using new materials and an, an experienced crew to build. And what, what we could deduce is that our CO2 footprint in this project was roughly 70% less, the material costs were 70% less, and the labor costs were 70% less. But it took three and a half times as long to build it. Mm. So that's actually what we're doing now, is we're optimizing that by creating um, a talent development program for youths, um, where we will use workshops to prefabricate elements for office buildings. So because you prefabricate it, you lower the, the production time. Um, and then we know we can bring this back down to maybe 
this as well, and then we've got a very, very optimized uh, approach. And the clean tech Delta is really interested in using this approach for a number of buildings in the, the city harbor area. Um, another project, I don't want to bore you with too many of the same. Can I ask a question? Quick? Yeah, sure. One of the next projects? Yeah, sure. Um, for that one, that, that's so interesting. I, I'm really curious about how you identified materials that you were going to use for the interiors. Yeah. Um, where, how you source separated those materials in order to make sure that you have the right type of each one. And what the shed area for, what was the geography that yeah. you pulled materials from for that project? Those are exactly the three key issues when you work in this way. Um, what we learned from this project was that uh, we were very um, limited by, uh, it was supply driven. So um, we had a, we worked with the municipality and they said, okay, this building is going to be demolished. So we literally scouted the building. We said, okay, we want these 37 doors. We designed a nice plan using the 37 doors. The day before the doors would have been taken out, uh, the building got squatted. <coughs> there goes your design. You can't use the doors anymore. So we adjusted our approach. Um, we uh, actually, in the future, we will not do a one-to-one -one kind of uh, trajectory. Actually, what you want is a kind of some kind of intermediary storage. So you have demolition and waste products, they need, should be stored somewhere, and that's where you actually do your sourcing, mm -hmm. because that means you have guarantee on which materials. Um, and then the, the range, well, we, we said as close to the building as possible, and then we also saw the, the furthest was, um, I think, uh, 68 kilometers away uh, for a particular element, which was really nice, uh, and the closest was 200 meters further up. So, what about the manufacturing space? Like where where did you produce? We produced everything on site. On site. Exactly. Yeah. So we just built a workshop there, and we worked with the with the team there. And with, and it was just construction and demolition. Uh, no, the dem where? demolition happened off site and not with this team. So the demolition happened uh, obviously at the demolition buildings. Right. And uh, we monitored every step of this, this every step. Right. right. And but the, yeah, the, I was asking about the um, the waste stream was just construction demolition waste stream. It wasn't. No, for customer. example, the clothing, uh, the clothing, um, because we wanted something acoustic, uh, the clothing was just 300 meters away, uh, a building where they collect secondhand clothes to, to ship to Africa. And we said we need to rent uh, eight tons of clothing for five years. And they really didn't comprehend the idea of <laughs> renting the, the clothes. So we bought them for 50 cents per kilo. And we washed them, and then we made uh, the acoustic elements. So, to, to pick up on that question in a slightly different way, all of those materials you picked up were basically to build the new building. Yeah. But the functions of the new building could also be based on materials that could be mined from the urban area. Yeah. So, if, for instance, the the, the beamer we have on there, the projector, uh, it gets obsolete. It could be demanufactured, yeah. which is a function that could go into the building and all its components could go into whatever new product there yep. are. Has there have there been any studies of all of this waste stream in the city that could lead to new enterprises that then could occupy the building in terms of generating new jobs? Yeah, that's actually a, a very nice bridge to this project. Um, this is a project based paid. on that question. <laughs> <laughs> Just go, we didn't time it but it's coincidental. Basically, um, we, we have data, we know which buildings are going to be dem demolished in the Rotterdam region in the coming 20 years. Uh, you never know 100% for sure, but we have an idea. Uh, we also know the percentages of materials uh, which will be